All right, we're going to call to order the meeting, the regular meeting of the Board of Commissioners, of February 6th at 5.15. Joanne? Ernst? Here. Commissioner Engel? Here. Commissioner Rollins? Here. Commissioner Vogelsang? Here. Commissioner Wright? Here. Uh, any changes to the agenda tonight? Nope. Uh, so we'll start off with public requests. Do we have any public requests tonight? My name is Harold Chaffee. I'm the uh, president of Keep Golf from Boca. I'd just like to know if uh, maybe you could allow us to basically open up the discussion after the lawyers talk about the uh, the the bond issue. Uh, number two. Yes. That we're going to be discussing. You want to know if we'll open it up? Well, I don't to... want to bore these people to death. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to be talking about it after. Um, it's up to the commissioners if we want to open it up to public comment afterwards. No. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Good evening, board members. My name is Jean-Michel Nau. I live at 818 Southwest 5th Street in Boca. I used to live near the Ocean Breeze um, closed golf course. And then, you know, walking in the area back then, I used to think, wow, it'd be a wonderful place to build a mountain bike trail with all the hills and the trees that you have there. And then, you know, I saw I was on the master plan for the project and I was very excited and I thought I would come here and voice my support uh, to show, uh, you know, that there's people out there who are really excited about it. My wife and I, my five-year-old son, uh, we like, like to live an active lifestyle. And then, you know, mountain biking is one thing that we like to do as a family. And when I don't ride with them, I ride with a group of friends that I met on the trail. Uh, it's a mix of you know, all ages, 30s, 40s, 60s, uh, all backgrounds, engineers and professionals. And then we all have one thing in common. We like to go on the trail and uh, change our mind from the busy lifestyle that we have. Um, you know, and a lot of uh, I see a lot of people out there doing just the same thing. And a lot of places, they have taken note of that. Uh, the counties and the cities, they're starting to support the trails more and more. Uh, you see, you know, Markham Park and Broad County with Quiet Water Park. You see JD and then even uh, Green Acres with uh, Pinehurst Trail. Um, so they all recognize that there's a need for that and their residents like it. Um, so I know the Beach and Park District in the city, they have a great offering of uh, recreation. Uh, but I think mountain bike uh, serves a good place on the on their list. Uh, you know, mountain biking is good for residents, but it's also... Building a trail is not a bad thing for those who don't like mountain biking, because even if you don't mountain bike, you know, you can see like a mountain bike can be built in a forest. You know, it's very low footprint. There's no big facilities, no infrastructure. So as someone who doesn't mountain bike, you can just walk by and be like, well, wow, that's a nice forest you have there. Like Pinehurst, I don't know if you've visited there, but it's a good example. You have a ball field, very visible. Next to it, you have a slash pine forest. You don't see anything. It's hard to find the trail. But then, so as someone who doesn't like mountain bike, they might just think, well, it's a beautiful landscape. So yeah, there's a way to integrate that into your trail. And, you know, many sports are hard to, uh, for busy families, you know, two working parents, you got to book your, your fees, your tea time, the scheduling, the driving by car. Uh, what I like about mountain biking is that you can just hop on your bike and most kids have a bicycle and just go ride the trail. It's simple. It's good for a busy family. It helps them stay active. Um, you know, mountain bike is good for economic development as well. Um, you know, a lot of uh, places, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the real estate developers here in Boca, the city, economic development, the employers, they want to attract uh, young people and work, young professionals to work here. Uh, sometimes when they look at that, uh, when before relocating, they look at the offering. And, you know, if mountain bike trails is something that they like, they might be more inclined to relocate to Boca. So it's good for that. Uh, some cities like Bentonville and Arkansas, they uh, made a case that, you know, it really works. They built uh, the Walton family spent close to a mil hundred million dollar building mountain bike trail just to attract workforce in Arkansas. There's no mountains over there. Like they, they built trails and they said, we need some workforce. People move there. And then uh, they were able to attract talent. So it's good for that, too. You have five or ten, five to ten bike shops in Boca. I'm sure they would appreciate having more riders in the area. And finally, it's good for the environment. This, the city has a sustainability plan. They have goals. And if you look at those goals, 
you know, maintain air, improve uh, air quality, water quality, increase tree canopy, wildlife habitat. All these things can be done on a mountain bike trail by planting trees. We don't pave anything. It's all, so it decreases the runoff of water. So it's good for the environment. It decreases the vehicle's mile travel. And I'm reading those are the goals from the plan. Uh, decreasing vehicle mile traveled. But the more people bicycle, they bike to the trail. They don't use their car to go on the trail. They don't have to pack their golf club, clubs in the trunk, drive their car, park it. You just ride your bike there. Um, I'm, I'm here today because, you know, my friends and I, we want to know how we can assist, how we can support you and your plan uh, so it's a successful project. Um, I know a lot of people in the community, uh, you know, a lot of volunteers that, you know, they just, they're just eager to help. They want to see those trails built. So, you know, if there's anything you'd like us to do, uh, any recommendation, I would like to hear from you. Thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, young, young professional, old professional. Uh, Jeff Smith, 1023 Southwest 13 Plate over in Boca Square. I'm also on the advisory committee in Boca for um, parks and Re recreation as well. I just joined this January, so I wanted to get involved. Um, I'm going to second everything Jean-Michel said. I'm not going to go through the exact same thing again, um, but the point being is mountain biking and mountain bikers are the people you want to do sports in your town because it is a sport that requires a little bit of spare capital. So you have time, you have energy, you have equipment, and then you spend your money in the community, right? So you're keeping money in the community, you're offering activity, you're offering ways for people to exercise. Um, I also volunteer down in uh, Broward County at Quiet Waters Park. I've been working there for three years straight building and managing the trails there. They're all volunteer built. Establishing a volunteer team to construct, maintain, and build so the manpower is free is what most trails do. I'd say 90 some percent of the trails in Florida are all volunteer built, takes the resources off of the various cities, counties, and state for the building process and the maintenance process, and you get people involved in nature building and constructing. Um, having a trail set in uh, Ocean Breeze is a wonderful idea. As Jean-Michel said, I would ride my bike up there from Boca Square, ride, and then ride back. I'd say we should put trails in other locations, too, to connect dots. So we ride to here. Oh, we're right here. I'll stop here and buy lunch. Oh, I'll ride over here and ride here. So it's a wonderful way to get the community moving and also another group of bikers to validate more bike lanes. Right. So if you have bike lanes in the city for transportation, my kids ride their bikes to school and the crossing guard system and the way it works. Great. Let's have even more of that for the adults like me who want to ride a bike to help the city and help the state with what they want to do. I am here also to say I will lead a team for you. I will establish the volunteer team and I'll switch to come over here and work for you guys and help you build it. OK, it's a wonderful opportunity. Um, there are trails in the state that are multi-use. Markham Park and Quiet Waters are only bike. Uh, West El Rey, which is also West Palm Beach, is multi-use, so you have hikers and bikers on it. It's an easy system to integrate. Bikers go backwards, riders go forwards, walkers yield to bikers because they'll see you first, because the bikers are moving faster. But it can be done. You can organize it. You can have trails that are adaptive for people that um, are out with different abilities. You can have beginner trails, intermediate trails, and advanced trails. It's a wonderful system. It's a way to be out there, and it's quiet. No motorized, no nothing. It's all people power. You might hear somebody say, "Woo!" It's not that crazy. You have a lot of people using mountain bikes, and the trails are a way to attract people. Real quick. Much. You're hired. <laughs> Hello, Robert Duquette, 5351 Northwest 3rd Terrace. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the uh, district for acquiring the uh, property at Ocean Breeze. I think saving the green space is important. Um, I can tell you that. Uh, I ride my bike every day throughout the city, 
uh, including about 40 miles in the last two days. And uh, so there's there's also a very good uh, bike trails already established. I know that as far as the plan is concerned on the west side of uh, the property at Ocean Breeze. Uh, the, all the parks that were discussed uh, as far as mountain bike trails, as well as Jonathan Dickinson State Park also has great mountain bike trails. None of those are next to residential area. Okay, I think that's something that you need to be mindful of. Uh, I know it's not next to my property. I think that the uh, bike paths like we have uh, at El Rio Trail, connecting that into the park, wherever you're gonna have bike trails would be very important. I know that the city might have to get involved to do the last leg uh, from the bridge down to Northwest Second Avenue. But of course, I do concur with uh, their recommendations always to increase the uh, bike trails uh, and bike paths throughout the city. Um, the other thing that uh, I wanted to mention is that your uh, review that you're gonna be having on the uh, bond council, uh, on January 3rd, I was here and talked about the, uh, the lack of the district's ability to convey property as per the state of Florida's letter. And uh, your letter that you have from your bond council, your outside council doesn't address that at all. Uh, so considering the fact that you have a lot of unknowns as far as your ability to design uh, and have especially a private public partnership, uh, I would not suggest that you approve tonight $888,000 for a project that uh, doesn't have clear understandings of how you're going to proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Hi, I'm Lauren Blosser. This is my husband, Todd Blosser, my kids, Joseph, Sandy. We live at um, 1579 Southwest Sixth Court in Carriage Hill. We're Boca residents. We have been in Boca our entire lives. We've seen so many changes over the years. Um, a lot of them great changes. There's a lot more development. There's a lot more activity, more people coming here, which is great. But we really are strong believers in the green space. And we would also like to propose for a mountain bike park. Um, you know, over with the Ocean Breeze Golf Course, when you think of mountain biking, you may have a certain person in mind, but this is my family. This is what we love. Um, we spent a lot of time in Colorado where my kids fell in love with mountain biking, and it would be so nice to have something here local in the city that we could do as a family, load up our bikes, bring a picnic lunch, go out for the day, get some fresh air. Um, it's just different. It's we ride our bikes on A1A as well too, but you know, you know, with the traffic, it's not always safe. Being in a mountain bike park like that, it makes it a safe environment. The kids can do things that they can't do out in the roads, like go up inclines and do fun things on their bikes. Um, it just it helps a lot with I think bringing families to Boca as well. And uh, you know, there is Markham Park, but that's far away. There's uh, Quiet Waters, that's a little bit far. It'd be so great to have something local that we could all do just for an hour even. And I do agree that it does bring a lot of revenue to the city as well, because a lot of families will come here and then maybe say, oh, wow, did you see that little restaurant on the way? Let's go stop there maybe. Or, you know, there's, there's just so much that it can do for the city. And um, it doesn't have to take up a whole lot of space for the trails or for the park. And also I think it'd be great because I know a lot of families that, would also be willing to help um, in terms of community service hours too. A lot of kids in high school, they can get community service for doing things and building trails is one of them. And that'd be a great way to get kids active in the community to come out, help build the trails, get involved. Uh, it just, I think it would be a really great thing and hope that you all will consider it, you know, for families as well. Thank you. Ooh. Hey, any other um, public requests? Nope. Okay, we'll go ahead and close public. Oh. Nope, no hands raised. Okay, we'll go ahead and close public requests and we'll do approval of the minutes of the previous board meeting held on January 17th at 515. Move to approve. Commissioner Ernst. Commissioner Engel? Yes. Commissioner Rollins? Yes. Commissioner Vogelsang? Yes. Commissioner Wright? Yes. Motion passes.
Okay, and we'll move on to regular business. Uh, the proclamation for Lynn Hurley. Um, commissioners, Madam Chair, um, tonight we are honoring a longtime volunteer in our community, Mrs. Hurley, Mrs. Lynn Hurley, who's worked with the Top Soccer Program here for over 20 years and has done so much for our community beyond that. And I can see by the crowd here tonight, I'm guessing most of you are here for her. Um, she Her impact has crossed multiple generations and um, we're honored to have her here tonight. I'm going to turn it over to our chair to read this proclamation and then some other board members that will likely want to weigh in on uh, her um, contributions to our community. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and read the proclamation. Whereas on behalf of the Greater Boca Raton Beach and Park District, I wish to record our deepest gratitude for the contributions of Lynn Hurley to the Boca Raton community. Whereas Mrs. Hurley has served as a volunteer and advocate for the special needs community for over half a century, Mrs. Hurley has served Boca Raton for over 20 years as a volunteer with the Soccer Association of Boca Raton Top Soccer Program. Her dedication and benevolence exemplify the spirit of community and service. Whereas Mrs. Hurley's contributions to the special needs community in Boca Raton have spanned generations, her advocacy and generosity have touched the lives of countless families in Boca Raton. Whereas Mrs. Hurley is accomplished and well-respected, Mrs. Hurley was recently honored as the National U.S. Youth Soccer Top Soccer Coach of the Year at the U.S. Youth Soccer's 2023 awards event held in, in uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Mrs. Hurley also received the Florida Youth Soccer Association's Top Soccer Coach of the Year in August and the South Region Top Soccer Coach of the Year in November. Whereas Mrs. Hurley's uh, devotion to advocacy and inclusion will transcend generations to come. Whereas the Greater Boca Raton Beach and Park District, along with Mrs. Hurley's friends, family, and generations of players are blessed to know her and be the beneficiaries of her dedication and selflessness. Now, therefore, I, Erin Wright, Madam Chair of the Greater Boca Raton Beach and Park District, on behalf of the entire Board of Commissioners, in recognition of Lynn Hurley's many contributions to our community and its citizens, do hereby proclaim our profound appreciation for her dedication to our community. I know Bob has something he wants to say. Your photos of everybody, so hang tight. Well, this wonderful lady has done so much for our community. Uh, the 20 years working with uh, these uh, children in our community that, that is an offspring of uh, the top so the top soccer is an offspring of the soccer association of Boca Raton and I'd be remiss without pointing out quickly that Larry Fairman our president is here to support Lynn's uh, presentation tonight. Um, I've known the Hurleys uh, probably as long as I've been in town and Lynn and her family of four boys uh, and one girl. Um, it was amazing how she could accomplish what she did. I've never seen a lady with more energy. I've never seen her without a smile on her face. I've never seen her not being willing to help uh, any any of our parts of our soccer program. And uh, Matthew, her son's here with her and her granddaughter. And of course, uh, her husband, Pat, uh, who's been a, a loyal supporter of her. Usually it's uh, the, the wife that's supporting uh, the, the husband. But in this case here, uh, Pat has been a dedicated uh, volunteer to Lynn's uh, efforts with top soccer. Uh, uh, Lynn uh, has, uh, you know, achieved heights that uh, nobody else in our soccer program has. I think uh, Erin mentioned that um, she was nominated to Florida Youth Soccer Volunteer of the, of the Year Award, hands down won that. And I, I thought that was the end of it, but that she was nominated to the Southern Regional uh, Top Soccer Volunteer of the, uh, the Year Award and uh, successfully navigated that. And then the uh, the national award, which is a, a pinnacle achievement that I think nobody in our club has achieved uh, in the soccer associations has achieved such designations as that. And it's because uh, Lynn A has a, a big heart. Uh, she, she loves what she does. She's an educator. Uh, she's been uh, doing this entire career. Uh, and uh, I'm so proud to be able to be participate in this presentation. Uh, 
and uh, I, I, I get too emotional to be doing these kind of things, but, uh, but uh, I want to say, Lynn, congratulations on behalf of the district. All of us here uh, recreate in some form or fashion, as you've seen with, uh, and, and doing this uh, job as, as commissioner, we've seen lacrosse grow, we've seen pickleball grow, uh, but none of it has been as strong and steadfast as what Top Soccer has, and you're the major benefactor for doing that. And we thank you as a as a recreation community and as commissioners and as members of the Soccer Association of Bogotown, you do us proud. Congratulations. Also, Lynn grew up in Boca. She attended Boca High, and she was elected homecoming queen at the time. <laughs> down at my own Sunday training center. And that's how it all started. I would drive down there and take a few students. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh okay, sorry. <laughs> Didn't know you were doing this. And um, it, it was so special being able to, to learn all about the special needs community down there. And and there were probably about maybe 100 children just in one room and, and that's where they lived. And I used to go down every month. I can't believe I would ever drive to Miami, but um, because I, I really am not a, I don't love driving, but way back when, back in the 60s, I would take a few of the girls in our club and take them down there. And, and that's how I actually got involved in special needs and, and just knew that this was what I had to do the rest of my life. And I, there was a, at the YMCA, it asked me if I would, start, um, the fa I founded a program at the YMCA for um, exceptional children. And, but other than that, I just love doing top soccer with people like, like Bob Rollins, who is behind soccer the way it is, and Susie. And it's just Vic Nocera, who's in charge of our program. It's just, um, it's been a dream come true. And my husband has just been behind me all the way. He was actually, he came and brought a uh, bunch of our family yesterday on uh, Saturday to the soccer game. And, and uh, so it's kind of a family affair. But this, oh my goodness, my heart was pounding as I was listening to Bob. It was just beautiful. I didn't expect 
any of you to come. I didn't even know. You. Well, I guess you would hear from your husband, I guess. <laughs> In my so it's, I just love all these children. And I'm a teacher. At, I'm um, work at Santa River Christian. And um, I just I love kids. I, I really do. And I my two little kids over here. I had one last year and I have one this year. But um, this is just such an amazing award. I really I do not like giving speeches at all. It's one thing. It was one thing in Philadelphia. I did have to give a speech, a very unprepared speech that I didn't know I had to do. And then started out saying that it's a lot more intimidating to be in front of all of you rather than a, a bunch of little three-year-olds. <laughs> three-year-olds and four-year-olds are so much fun. And, and the parents are even fun to talk to. But um, I just have to say thank you. This has just been amazing. Yeah. All of these guys in my paper. <laughs> Thank you so much. Out of them. <laughs> Thanks, Brianna. Thank you. Such a beautiful. Yeah. We'll send you the photos as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Oh. All the oh, yes. All the oh, all the students. I'm not a student. He said he'd never come to a meeting, and this is the meeting. I said we finally got her to a meeting. Actually, I came to some on our anniversary. Oh, okay, that's right. Bob wouldn't miss a meeting. You know. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming tonight. <laughs> Thank oh, you. Thank you. Oh, 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 oh,
I don't want to be that person. Okay. All right. There's some really nice people in this world still, aren't there? Like truly just really honestly nice people. Um, okay, so moving on to regular business number two, bond council review, bring in. I'm actually gonna turn this over to Mr. Gorin to introduce our team that is joining us virtually. Thank you, uh, Madam Executive Director, Madam Chair, Commissioners, good evening and uh, hmm, no sound coming out here. Good to hear. Thank you very much. Th this evening is a, is a presentation requested by the commission in recent days with regard to the relationship between the district uh, and the proposed Ocean Breeze Park Master Plan project and a number of different in intricacies regarding bond, bond relationships, bond issues between the city of Boca Raton and the district, uh, as well as proposed plans and interlocal agreements that govern those relationships. As you know, when we spoke about this issue some number of weeks ago, uh, we suggested and urged the, 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 the commission to engage outside bond council, and we have done that at, at your behest and through your authority. That bond council is, is Bryant Miller and Olive. They're out of Tallahassee, and you see on the screen Jolinda Herring, who is a colleague and friend of mine for a number of years. She's the managing partner for the law firm that has offices throughout the state of Florida uh, and who are, in fact, certified uh, as bond counselors, and she'll explain more about that qualification and how she got to be in that position. Uh, with her partner, Will Milford, who's also uh, on the screen, he'll be happy to, to, to include the discussion that we, talk, we talked about as well. We, we shared with Jolinda and with Will a number of different documents, including the interlocal agreements with the City of Boca Raton. We shared with them certain bond documents that were available both online and otherwise. Uh, as, as well as uh, some legal opinions we had issued in the recent past regarding potentially 3P projects, which are public-private partnerships, and whether or not 3P projects would have some application with regard to the future of Ocean Breeze Park as proposed in the master plan. The second part of which is we also shared with our bond council information regarding exchanges we have with the attorney general's office, which will be part of the conversation this evening. And as the, um, uh, the matter proceeded, you have in the backup this evening a memorandum from the Bryant Miller Allen firm in Tallahassee, uh, a memorandum from both uh, Jolinda as well as Will Milford regarding specifically public-private partnerships, which, which addresses a number of different issues, all, many of which I'm going to suggest that but Jolinda and Will will, will be best suited to, to respond to. And there was, in fact, response in this document to the AG's analysis, which I would like to stress for the record, which they'll also address to some degree as well. Um, we are not bond lawyers. We are government practitioners. We specialize in the things that we specialize in. The folks that do this kind of work have a very special um, um, skill set. Um, for example, they'll speak to you about the issues of why, in fact, they, they can issue bond opinions that relate to tax, tax, taxability and tax-free issuance, which does matter in the context of this discussion. Uh, that being said, Madam Chair um, and Commissioners, with your permission, Jalinda is present this evening and I believe would be helpful to open up the door for, for you to give you a, a, a walkthrough of the memo, allow you to ask questions that you may have with regard to anything that's in the memorandum and to ask any questions thereafter that might emerge from that conversation. This document is a public record. It's not a privileged document. It's not confidential. We asked for it. We're in the public public light. Uh, it's on the dais. It's been published as well as been posted in the city's in the city's in, in the district's website. And others have a right of access to that document. Uh, with your permission, Madam Chair and others, I'd like to introduce you to Jolinda Herring and Will Milford, who are here this evening via Zoom, uh, and are prepared to open the door for discussion about the memo and any and all matters that relate to the inquiry that was made by the board, and which we offer back to them for their assistance to us. Linda, good evening, and Will, good evening. Nice to meet with you. Good evening. Good evening. Um, good evening. Um, my name is Jolinda Herring, and I am with the law firm of Bryant Miller and Olive PA. Um, our firm has been in existence since 1970, and we have started out as a municipal bond law firm. Um, that's our expertise. That is what we do. Um, I personally have been practicing in that area for over 20 years, uh, working with a number of local governments throughout the state of Florida, um, specifically Miami-Dade County, Broward County, and Palm Beach County, um, as well as Leon County and a number of um, municipalities throughout the state as well. Um, I have with me my um, partner, Will Milford, um, who is our tax attorney and specializes in the tax aspects 
of public finance transactions. Um, as stated, we have submitted a memo to you uh, for your consideration and questions. Uh, one of the issues that was brought to our attention was whether or not the district had the ability to enter into a P3 um, transaction. So taking a look at the statute, which is section 255 of the Florida statutes relates to public-private partnerships, under that statute, the district does meet the criteria to be able to do a transaction under that particular statute. And when you look at the definitions of those types of entities that are able to enter into these types of transactions, the districts do fall up under um, those definitions as a special district. And again, for the types of projects um, as a recreational project, um, again, the district does fall into it based on the type of project that you are envisioning, as well as what the statute says. Um, so we would need to have a little bit more information about the structure of the P3 before we could give anything to definitive in terms of whether or not that particular structure that would be considered, uh, whether or not you would have the ability to move forward with that particular structure. Um, and my partner, Will Milford, will talk about some additional tax considerations and other alternatives. Um, we also took a look at the existing debt that was entered into by the city of Boca Raton on your behalf um, for the Ocean Breeze Golf Course. Um, so based on those documents, um, the district could repay their loan back, and which would pay off the bonds, which would then terminate the interlocal agreement, which is the obligation that the district has to repay that debt pretty much at any time. There may be a penalty, so you would need to engage someone specifically to determine whether or not um, specifically just paying that debt off right now and freeing yourself from that obligation uh, from a financial standpoint, um, if that would be worth it. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Will to talk about the tax considerations and other alternatives. Sure. Thanks, Jolinda. I just wanted to, to point out some background here. The IRS places certain uh, limitations you know, with respect to any, any governmental tax-exempt bonds. They place limitations on the amount of private business use that can be um, had with respect to the bond finance property. And so, you know, in, in talking about the, the debt that was issued by the, the city, you know, for the benefit of the district, that places restrictions on that property that was financed with bond proceeds on private business use. And so this becomes a critical concern when we're evaluating any of the proposed P3 structures, because, you know, depending on how that P3 is structured, it may have an impact on those existing tax exempt bonds. So in the memo, we had laid out some of those tax considerations as it relates to the bond issue and the impact that it would have there, because um, you know the tax exempt status of the bonds is is very closely tied to the cost of the interest on the bonds, and, and so you know any any impact on the tax exempt status of the bonds might in turn then you know cause for a higher interest cost, for example. Um, you know one potential P3 structure. And again, we we don't know what exactly has been proposed or is being explored, but one thing that we have seen elsewhere is um, kind of a management contract type of arrangement where the district would enter into an agreement, you know, potentially on a long-term basis with a, a private management company to provide management services of the golf course. The IRS has... Um, a, some guidelines in this area that place uh, safe harbor guidelines on when this would not have a negative impact on the bond issue and would not be treated as private business use. Um, I won't go to, through every single one of those here in this meeting, but you know the, the bottom line is that the net profits or net losses of the operation would be required to 
fault of the district uh, and not to the private manager because the, the IRS doesn't want this to look like a lease. Uh, so it's, it, it still needs to be the district's operations in order to qualify under these management contract guidelines. But um, you know, there, it can be structured in a way that would allow uh, you know, some, some benefits to both parties. Um, so, and, and then also another key element here is that the, the district would, would truly maintain control over the operations. Uh, the, the safe harbor guidelines dictate that that can be done through a kind of an annual budget approval process where the, you know, the, the manager might prepare a budget and then uh, send it back to the district for an annual approval. Of, um, and, the, and the district has the ultimate say of the setting of rates for, for the use of the property. Um, another option that we laid out in the memo that I, you know, I'm not sure in, in practice whether would have much application is a, a, a nonprofit 501c3 manager. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of you know, whether or not there are any, any nonprofits that might have a, um, an exempt purpose of operating these types of facilities. But you know, if, if that were to exist, if there were to be a nonprofit 501c3 manager, um, there is a, a mechanism under the, the IRS guidelines for the bonds to be reissued as qualified 501c3 bonds. Uh, we would have a public hearing and, um, and you know, file with the IRS and, and then the bonds could continue to be tax exempt, but would um, you know, it's kind of an acknowledgement of, of that 501c3 entity um, being a beneficiary of the bond financing. And then finally, you know, other options, if, if there were, if there was, if the district intended to enter into a P3 arrangement that, that could not meet those management contract safe harbor guidelines, for example, or, you know, would result in private business use of the bonds, then, uh, you know, there would be potentially options to redeem the bonds, uh, you know, by either refunding those with other taxable debt instruments or, you know, possibly negotiating with the bank to amend the taxable, to amend to a taxable rate. Uh, that is, is, there is a taxable rate for the bonds in the bond documents, but that, you know, any amendment to that rate would probably require, uh, you know, some further involvement of both the, the lender and and any of these options would involve the uh, the city as well, since it was the city's bond issue. Jolinda, was there anything I missed that you thought we should point out from the tax side? Um, no, not from the tax side, but I did want to say, um, I think that once the district um, determines a structure and wants maybe to move forward with a financing, we would recommend doing a judicial process called a validation. Um, under the Florida statutes, a governmental entity could go into court and ask them to basically validate the debt um, to make sure that the revenue source that they have the authority to enter into the contracts, um, use the security that's being pledged um, and any other issues. So um, we would recommend that process at that point. Um, that process usually takes about 90 days um, prior to being able to actually um, consummate a transaction. So we'll open it up to any questions you may have at this time. Craig. First of all, thank you. Thank you very much. It's very thorough. So to just so I, I'm, I'm very, um, I like the outlook of it. it. It basically gives you three options. You have a management contract that you can enter into with the P3. It has to meet these nine guardrails that is provided from a tax perspective. And that means that um, that's really up to that third party if they want to meet these requirements and we accept it. So that makes it doable. Um, they're very you know specific. The other option is entering into an agreement. Number two, as you point out, a nonprofit 501c manager to oversee it. Um, so that's promising. There's two options. And then the third option is just to pay off the bonds and then you don't have to deal with it. Um, so to me, you, you, you mission accomplished. Um, my own question is on the validation of Florida, is that a Florida, who do you go to for that? Is that like a... Um, 
a court, a state, who, who's going to give yeah. us that validation when you do come? So if we came along and said, we have a nonprofit who is interested in running this thing, that's my first question. I got one more question. Who do we go to for that validation? Yes. So you would go to the district court. And so you would file um, a complaint, which uh, we would certainly help you with and do all that work for you on your behalf, uh, file a complaint and it would be get against the state attorney. The state attorney would be representing the state of Florida uh, with notice to all of the citizens in the city of Boca Raton since, you know, um, and the district. So yeah, that's a procedure you can go in. It's a voluntary procedure. Okay. Um, no problem. Yes. The, the second question, a couple times in the document, you mentioned for golf services. What if it's not golf? Does it have to be golf? Or um, It does not have to be golf. Um, that's what we were told, that it was for a golf facility. Um, but if there is anything else that falls under that recreational, um, I believe that you know we would be okay with that. But we would certainly look at whatever other project you had. Um, to be able to give you that analysis. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I do want to point out that, that with respect to your question as to, you know, what if it was for something other than golf, you know, there is a chance that there, there is a de minimis amount of private business use that is allowed, for example, like less than 10% than of the bond finance property. And so something other than golf that might just comprise a, a very small portion of the property you know, that's something we could look at and, and might fall within that de minimis threshold. Golf is, you know, a golf course is a much larger piece of this. So that's kind of always going to be in that in that range of, of something that must be examined. But uh, thanks guys for coming in and helping us with this. Um, if we ask the city to run whatever facility uh, was in question, whether it be golf or a swimming pool or even maintaining trails, uh, would that, would that uh, come under, let me rephrase that, would that be uh, uh, viable under the terms of the bond agreement? So if we had, the city is running uh, a golf course at Boca Raton, if we had asked them to run the driving range, uh, would that be a, a viable means within uh, IRS guidelines? Yes, that that would, and you would not, um, you not run run afoul of any of these rules if the city were the party that were uh, managing that. Okay, and we wouldn't have to reissue the bonds. Correct, you would not. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, I I certainly. Uh, echo what Steve and Craig said. We appreciate your input. It really cleared up uh, things and narrowed down the scope of what um, uh, we might be able to do. And, and, and just, uh, you know, you, you reiterated uh, what uh, we had been previously told that we do not have the authority to sell, lease, or otherwise uh, convey real property. And the way around that uh, was with these proposals that Craig outlined, the management contract, the nonprofit, or the uh, but the, the, the question that um, I was wondering, if you were under a management contract, I mean, what these people are doing are just running the project for you, but you provided the capital to put the uh, facilities up and they're, they're just dropping in there to um, run it uh, with your oversight, uh, your approval of their budget. Um, and there's um, the profit or loss of this facility is on us rather than the operator, is that correct? That's correct. And that's that's dictated by the IRS and these safe harbor guidelines. Uh, you know, I will say that sometimes when we're working with local governments, that's not what they want out of the deal. You know, they may want they may think a golf course is going to operate in the red for a few years and, and want to put shift that over to the private party. And that um, that doesn't usually work under IRS guidelines. So, you know, that but that is that is how it would have to be structured in order to comply from an IRS standpoint? Well, I, I think originally uh, there had been some discussion, which has since been put to rest, that uh, some of the P3s would come in and develop the property itself uh, under a, a lease of some description that would be a valid way to convey that 
without expending our capital to put the project together. But um, obviously that's not permissible with the bonds that we have without creating a taxable. Uh, well, we, we, we can't do that by our enabling legislation, number one. Um, but with the management contract, we would have control of the operation, dictate uh, that pricing structure, review their budgets. Uh, and uh, if they if, if a profit was made after expenses, we retain that. If it was a loss, then uh, we also retain that as well. Is that pretty much a decent summary of what uh, management agreement is contract? Yeah, the, no, that 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 is a decent summary. I mean, we have seen some arrangements where a, a private manager might contribute some capital to the project, but you know, we, we can look at if if anything is proposed, we can look at the details of of a particular arrangement to see how it might work. But, right, but well, wouldn't you also um, they would be allowed to pay that management company a set fee for the management yes. of the project? Yes, yes, absolutely. And so, so that's where the uh, incentive is for somebody to come in to do that because they're earning income themselves versus uh, uh, through the fee structure that we would uh, set up with them if we made that agreement. Yeah, and they can be paid. They can be paid a fixed amount. They can be paid a percent of gross revenues, or they can be, be reimbursed expenses. But they can't be paid net profits, basically. So that's that's the limits on the the compensation arrangements. I, I think that uh, the original position that we were in, in the beginning stages, we were thinking that if we didn't have to use our capital, which uh, our, our capital is pretty much allocated to the projects on a year to year basis, that a, a P3 arrangement uh, was might be an acceptable way to go. But it looks to me like, you know, as Craig outlined, we have three options uh, and none of which of those are going to conserve any of our capital because we'll have to put out the capital to get the facilities in place and then have figured out which way we want the facility to be operated, correct? Yes. Is that a correct statement? Yes. Yes. Uh, no, yes. 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 Yeah. And, you know, and it sounds uh, to me a, a great deal like almost like what we have with the city today with our, our current arrangement. Uh, we, we have the property. Uh, they We reimburse them for their expenses uh, to maintain the, the property on our behalf. So I, I, I appreciate to you narrow this thing down for us. It's clear now as to what we, what options we might have and it's up to us to decide, you know, how we're going to go, go farther. Uh, it's probably going to extend that the time that we're going to need to develop this property uh, because it is our revenues from ad valorem revenue, as you, as you know. And um, so we're pretty, um, you know, rigid about where we can, where the funds come from and the opportunities we have to use those uh, as we expand our facilities, uh, get a, a little bit more narrow. So thank you very much for your input on this. Great, appreciate it. You're welcome. Susie, good to have you here, um, even if it is by Zoom. Um, if the one option to have a 501c3 fund and operate um, a facility on on that west side of the property, would the cost of reissuing the bond and the increased um, interest would would that be significant? It's possible that and this is there's there's definitely some unknown here. It's possible that it could be reissued without impacting the interest cost at all. Um, but but some of it would to to affect a reissuance as a qualified 501c3 bond would require the consent and approval of the lender and the city and and you know we just don't know what the whether the lender would see that as something that would would cause them to want to reconsider the interest rate um, so that that's an and unknown on our part, you know, I do think that, you know, market rates are probably higher now than they were at the time it was entered into. And, but so, so that if, if there was additional funding needed, then that would probably have a higher interest rate. But um, it, it, from a tax standpoint, it could be reissued without any change to the interest rate. And as far as this validation, is that an adversarial type of um, procedure? Or do you think that it would, aggravate the city 
or uh, could could it be a very uh, kumbaya type of situation? <laughs> right. It generally it is not an adversarial proceeding, um, and it is not necessarily against the city. They are noticed. Um, but the complaint is filed against the state attorney who represents the state of Florida. So the state attorney would be aggravated with us? No, he would not be <laughs> aggravated with us. This is a very common procedure um, that we do quite often. Um, it's just a way to get some certainty and some finality um, to some questions that may be outstanding on a particular bond transaction. And what kind of a monetary uh, consideration is that? Um, generally, if it is not appealed, um, so what happens when you go into court and you're able to get a final judgment, um, someone has 30 days to appeal that judgment. And that would be anyone that appeared at the original hearing, not just someone that comes along and said, oh, I just seeing this, I don't like it. So they would have had to have appeared at the original hearing and stated um, some objection or somehow interjected themselves into the, to the process. Um, if it is not appealed after that 30 day period, it's final, no one can come along and appeal, it stands. If someone appeals, it goes straight to the Supreme Court. Um, that's the one good thing about the bond validations, um, because the state and the legislature feels it's just that important. It goes straight to the Supreme Court, um, and the Supreme Court will, will hear the issue. Um, to do that, um, if there is no objections, if we don't think anybody's going to come in and object to this, um, it's generally about between fifteen dollars to $20,000 um, for us to do that. Um, then if it would be more if it gets appealed. Thank you. That was a great explanation. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Madam Chair, if I can just insert one question before you, if I can. Uh, Jolinda and Will, as you know, we have uh, had occasion as law firms to uh, interface on bond validations in the past um, yes. to the extent that a validation is in the local court. It's in the circuit court, not, not, the dis not federal district court, but local uh, court. Um, and it's a civil proceeding. So when you name the state attorney, if I may quickly offer, it's not that you have a criminal proceeding. It's civil in nature. There's a civil division within the within the state attorney's office that actually would respond to and does respond to petitions such as this, which are complaints like you would file a complaint in a civil lawsuit. Um, but the burden is on the local government, on the bond issuer to, to do to basically two things that the issue is a public purpose issue. It's for a specific public purpose. And the revenues from the bonds are sufficient to pay the bondholders back so that there won't be a, a debt incurred that you can't pay for as a public entity. If I'm not mistaken, Jolinda, well, those are the two premises on which a court would consider the issue as the principal basis upon which to do a bond validation. Correct? Yes, that is correct. And in, in many instances, validations help to give certainty, which is exactly what I think you've heard so, for example, in other venues, we've had some validations in the recent past regarding, for example, local government um, uh, providing senior housing, senior affordable housing, which is not a core um, service that local governments provide, although the bill that's pending before the legislature now passes, it will become a very significant core issue for local government. Um, the end result of which is, is that um, the issuance of bonds for bondholders, they want certainly to know that, that a local government, whether it be a district or a city or a county, uh, is issuing bonds specifically that have a public and municipal purpose, and they can be paid for by the bond issue, and that there's money so that there's no debt incurred that would otherwise cause the residents, taxpayers, to be impacted by that. If I'm not mistaken, that's also a component of the, the conversation. Yes. If a 501c3 were to come in and say that they would manage the property, would that fall under having to reissue the bond? It would. Yeah, it, the, the the IRS kind of views you, you have governmental bonds for pure governments, and that that's how these bonds were issued. And a 501c3 bond is a different type of tax exempt bond. And so the reissuance in, in one sense is a manner of just telling the IRS that these are no longer governmental bonds and now they are 501c3 bonds. But there are certain procedures in place for 501c3 bonds we would have to comply with in order to do that. Um, one of those is, is to have a public hearing. Uh, so we call it a, a TEFRA hearing. It's a, just a, a public hearing to say that these bonds are being reissued in this sense. 
as qualified 501c3 bonds for this purpose and then and then the, and then would be approved by a, a the city i think at that point so so will can the 50 can the district establish the 501c3 that, that wasn't um who would be doing it it would yeah. be an outside group someone yeah. outside the you know it wouldn't be this board right Brought up another question. Could we establish a 501c3 and hire people uh, to be employed by that 501c3? That would in turn run the course and we would pay their salaries without having to uh, reissue bonds. If the... If the 501c3 were still viewed as, as, if you could do it without creating a 501c3 to have some other governmental entity, then you wouldn't have to reissue. If it was a 501c3, you would require the reissuance. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Jolinda and Will, for the memorandum and all the information. I think this gives us a lot to discuss and think about. Um, uh, anything else from you on this? Nope. Okay, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank right. you. Thank you, counselors. Yes. So we're going to go ahead and reopen public comment um, based on the discussion that you just heard and the information that you just heard. Um, if anybody would like to get up and say anything, <laughs> you are more than welcome, as requested. <laughs> okay, so we're going to close public comment, no public comment on that. Um, and we're going to move on to number three, community redevelopment area funding. Brian. Commissioners, I just need a motion tonight to defer the public hearing scheduled for February 21st regarding our contribution to the City of Boca Raton's Community Redevelopment Agency. Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion that uh, we defer that discussion as requested. And we'll do roll call on that. Mr. Ernst? Ringle? Yes. Commissioner Rollins? Yes. Commissioner Vogelson? Yes. Commissioner Wright? Yes. Motion passes. Okay, on to number four, Miller Leg, who's been waiting patiently. <laughs> Miller Leg work order. Um, you, yeah. Just page 12 of your um, agenda packet starts the work order. This is for the east side of the property, which we own outright and can develop and start working on. Lumi is here from Miller Leg. She'll introduce the team and answer any questions you have. As well, we're going to get him loaded up here. Sorry about that. Um, online as well should be uh, Jonathan Burgess with uh, Spinnaker Group. There are our sustainability uh, consultants. And there's Mike and Jonathan. Um, you guys might know Mike Kroll, our president. Hi, Mike. Good evening. Can you hear us? Yeah, you're good? Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. All right. So um, we're here to present our uh, work order for the design of the uh, eastern portion, linear portion of the master plan project. 
Um, it includes uh, trails, community gardens, uh, dog park, um, kind of botanical nature preserve areas, as well as um, mountain biking areas. Can you hear me better? So I've, many of you guys have been with us along the whole process. Um, thank you guys for always showing up. Um, basically, uh, this portion of the project would be uh, very easier to design just because of, of the uh, amount of trails and um, not uh, heavily structured uh, areas to, to provide. sure we're all on the same page this fee summary is just for the east side not at all for the west side correct correct so okay. it would be our trails and the hills area okay all right and uh, anybody want to start us off craig um tough question out of the box <laughs> at the very beginning of this meeting we had uh several different people come in and say they would help us do this and they sound like they're pretty experienced and they're very excited about the bmx uh, uh, no, not bmx I'm not sorry. bmx mountain bike mountain bike the Two mountain totally bike, yeah. different things just keep the that in mind <laughs> trails so uh, that's true okay it's not atvs it's not that either so my question to you is in the design do we have um room or is there a mechanism to have community input from people who use these things because i'd like to make sure that the people who are involved in it come along and say that was a great idea but you know maybe you should consider this or consider that. Um, I, I think our whole idea with the design for the mountain biking, it actually supports. Um, usually kind of you leave that area to kind of overgrow and it's really the community and, and, and um, you know, volunteers that go out there and, and, and actually design it out. So we'll do kind of the initial maybe first like mile out of it and then it's all about volunteers that go out there because it's really just a natural overgrown area and it's really the volunteers or um, the mountain bikers who track this area and create it so we I will allocate the space for it and you know do the trailheads and the amenities for it but it's really kind of that's what we envision it's more of a volunteer um, combination with us absolutely and and Lumi if I could just add to that 100% uh, Commissioner Erst. Um, that is the intent. Um, we would probably do the initial layout of the alignment um, and then actually with community groups such, such as at Markham Park and, and also uh, Amelia Earhart Park in, uh, in Miami-Dade. We've collaborated with the, uh, with the folks out there that do the actual construction of it as well as long-term maintenance and they're, they're all volunteers. So again, that would be our intent is that that's what we would do. We would start laying it out, especially along the eastern edge of uh, adjacent to the canal where we do have some existing tree coverage and such because that really creates the, um, the obstructions, I won't say obstructions, but the, the uh, elements that you, that you mountain bike around. Um, and then as we move forward with the, with the future phases, we start adding other undulation and we really are going to incorporate earthwork in to create actual more hills and topogra topographic relief so it, it improves the uh, interest and the uh, diversity of uh, experience on the mountain bike differently i appreciate that so now i understand the, the mountain bike part of it will there be an opportunity for community input on as we get deeper into the process before cement and stuff goes in the ground or does it kind of go? Yeah, no, um, you know, I'll, if I could just add to that, this will have to go through the site planning process, uh, approval process with the city of Boca Raton. And obviously that is a public process. Uh, the public is made aware of that. And, you know, there are certain things uh, in this in this project that we are going to develop in, and present to you. It's not going to be kind of behind closed doors and we're just going to show up with a plan. So you'll be made aware of that, especially areas um, significantly uh, dealing with the, uh, the buffering um, between the residential community and the park, how we deal with that from a security perspective, as well as a, just a physical uh, uh, a visual and even auditory uh, buffering of the park from uh, from the adjacent residences and such. So yes, there'll there'll be 
the public is going to know kind of where we are in the process and and uh, the designs that we're developing. And just wanted to add, um, there's actually going to be an initial branding and conception of the project with the naming, um, and the public is actually encouraged to take a survey and be part of that process. So since the very beginning, they'll be they'll be a part of it. You know, following up with uh, Craig's comment, uh, Mike, I'd hope that at the appropriate time when we can bring these volunteers in, that you'll recognize that's the, the opportunity. Uh, because, you know, the, I was impressed with the enthusiasm of these uh, individuals and the organization I think that they can probably bring. And when they said they would help uh, construct and maintain, I was all about that. You know, I think that would, it's going to be, you know, the project for those folks. And as enthusiastic as they are, I, I want to make sure we capture that. So kind of rely on you guys and when at the appropriate time, help us get the message out as to how we gather these uh, folks together. We've got the names of the two that spoke this evening, and I think that there probably would be a good contact for us. But at the appropriate time, please let us know when we need to engage those folks in the, in the process. Absolutely. Yes, sir. So it's quite a project for you, wasn't it? Um, what kind of a, a timeline are we looking at for, are you going to be doing um, north versus south? Are you going to be moving dirt on um, both sections at the same time, you know, proposing that dirt, dirt be moved on both sections at the same time? You know, when would we be able to go out for a construction RFP? Sure. And, and I guess it really, um, how we're going to structure this is we're going to design the whole area at once. And then what we're going to do is at each submittal phase, we'll prepare an opinion of probable cost. So what that will allow us to do is start talking about and understanding the, uh, based upon the uh, available funding, what improvements we definitely can include into the uh, construction documents and the bidding. So that will start defining what areas we will be able to be done in the initial phase or subsequent phases and such. So that's really kind of the key thing. The, the second big thing is going to be the site plan approval process with the, the city of Boca Raton. So we'll have to go through that process. And again, um, like Commissioner Rollins said, that's going to be an uh, you know engagement right up front. You know, it, when we are preparing the um, schematic plans, um, as we heard in our workshop with the uh, with the city, they really need to have more specific plans so they can understand from a site plan approval process what any what or if any issues they may have during that process. So we're going to work with them up front to st help streamline that uh, site plan approval process. So again, understanding that we'll have schematic uh, review or schematic plan development. Then we'll have a meeting with the, the city to kind of review that, um, streamline it from there, move into design development phase uh, process, then begin the site plan approval process. Cause then we will have adequate um, design level documents to review with the city on a very formal process. So I anticipate that the site plan approval process will be six to nine months probably um, on the outset. Um, I think that would be a reasonable time. We don't, I don't think we have a contentious project here. Um, so again, I think that uh, we'll be collaborating with the city right up front uh, to identify the improvements that we anticipate to be done on this project and, and get their input so, so we can help streamline that project. Um, so if that is in fact the case, I think that we could probably put this out to bid um, next year um, hopefully maybe the first quarter of next year. And then, you know, depending upon the process, uh, would probably be 30, or I'm sorry, 60 to 90 days to maybe, you know, evaluate proposals, get them under contract. So probably the, uh, the end, the third quarter, fourth quarter of next year would probably be a target to, uh, get some construction activity going on. Thank you, Mike. Certainly. And I like, I like to add that, um, trying to be proactive and doing our due diligence. We already started, we did meet with the city um, to see what it entitles with the site plan approval process. Uh, one question on the sustainability gap analysis. Jonathan's still on or no? Yes, I'm here. 
Yes. Okay. So one quick question. I know. So what is the cost difference right now if we adhere to the sites and we get like the lowest level certification, let's say, what's the cost difference between that and actually getting certification? So this, the certification fee that is administered by the Green Business Certification Institute, that's GBCI, the same body that certifies lead projects, also certifies sites projects. So their certification fee is $6,500, I believe, for a project this size. Uh, yeah. That would essentially be the difference between general consulting for sustainability um, related to the landscape and hardscape and irrigation improvements and all the amenities um, and an actual certification. Oh, yeah. And is there any ongoing cost after or any um, is there any prerequisites that have to be maintained after the certification is achieved with the sites program? There that are. There yeah, are that are follow up on later okay. policies and procedures that would kind of define the best practices for landscape management overall, um, but those don't necessarily carry any hard cost premiums. It's just the um, just, you know, as long as we can get into the design process and the construction documents to uh, to highlight the best practices, it should actually reduce your maintenance costs compared to a traditional landscape. OK, so the sixty five hundred is basically the certification fee on top of the just the sustainability consulting that you're doing right now. Correct. OK, so it might be worth getting the site certification for our property, at least the east side of the property right now. Um, or we can look into it at least, yes. Thanks for coming in tonight. Um, I have a question with regard to uh, Jeffrey Street, which is probably uh, the elephant in the room, and maybe this is premature, uh, <laughs> but absent a tunnel, or some kind of overpass, uh, the hills and the trails will actually be developed, will have to be developed as two separate parks. Am I correct? Yeah, I, I, again, uh, ultimately, they that is correct. I'll just say that the easy answer is yes, they will be, they will have to be separated. They'll be bisected by Jeffrey Street without an overpass or a tunnel. Um, they will have, um, again, pedestrian linkages, but it would either be a mid block crossing, um, which I'm not sure um, that that would be allowable at this point in time, or it would have to be uh, a crossing, pedestrian crossing at uh, Jeffrey Street and Second Avenue. Okay, and whatever happens with, the, even with the east side, uh, whatever impact it has on Jeffrey Street will be subject to uh, site plan approval by the city. Yes, sir. And, and um, how we've kind of got the, the plan shown right now is in, in concept is that we have drives that are serviced from the existing right of way into the hills and to the trails. And those mm -hmm. driveways and those parking areas are laid out currently. And again, it's, it's very conceptual now that they would work with the proposed right of way to to bisect those two areas. So it wouldn't have to be modified after after the roadway would come in. Okay, and I take it then, uh, whatever maintenance facility we have on the east side, we'll be able to service uh, both segments of the park from that one maintenance facility. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And again, there would probably be an access point. You know, they could they could access it at Second and uh, Jeffrey, or they could actually go to the north end of the of the project and and tie in at that location too. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Any further questions? Anything on the certification? I mean, I agree with that. If you're going to go down this path, let's do it right. I mean, small cost, and I think some some of the I haven't looked at it that closely. The specific credits, but again, that's the sustainability consultant will go through um, our plans and see you know what low hanging fruit i think that we can achieve um and then also we have to decide what level of certification we actually want um but he again he can tell us you know based on you know how much extra money we want to spend and things like that what kind of certification we're looking at 
but $6,500 to achieve. And, it, and and like he said, in the end, it will save us in maintenance costs as well. And it'll help us target things like native plantings and reduce water consumption and things like that. So I think, it, and we don't have, I don't think there's any sites certification properties that the city owns or we own or things like that. So I think it would be a great thing and a great marketing tool for us as well. Um, so I think it's a good idea. So is it in here or do we have to add? Well, so, so they discuss, um, where is it? It's task eight. It's discussed the sustainability gap analysis. So that covers the sustainability consulting, Jonathan, where you would um, review the the credits with Lumi and us and go through them and do the documentation and all that. And then if we decide to go for certification, you would have that documentation ready in order to do that. Correct. Exactly. And to your point earlier about the being kind of a differentiator, this would be, to my knowledge, the first project in all of Palm Beach County. Um, there is one uh, project over in Broward County uh, that is, that has achieved sites um, in the pilot phase, but uh, but this would be the first in all of Palm Beach County, as far as I'm aware. Are there any other certifications that you would recommend other than the site certification? Sites is really designed uh, for this exact application. It's the Sustainable Sites Program for Sustainable Landscapes. Um, so where LEED is really focused on the vertical construction of a building in the interior, this is really ideally designed for an outdoor recreational facility like this. Okay. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, uh, it, we could speak a little bit more to this. Um, is that's really the intent of the of the gap analysis is that at that point in time we're going to identify and meet with the district and, and talk to you about what the ongoing commitments would need to be and at that point that's that's really the decision making point that Jonathan and and, and Spinnaker is going to tell us is these are the things you have to do going forward and if you as the district are not comfortable with that we don't have to go through sites but again, as Jonathan has said, you know, we're going to we're going to lay out some of the reduced uh, maintenance requirements or uh, design efforts that will um, result in a uh, reduced maintenance requirements for the uh, for the project. Jonathan, um, is there some reading material you could forward on a website for the different types of certifications and what what's involved so that we, you know, not only in getting certified, but the ongoing, so that we have an idea. I, I know Aaron is very um, well-versed in this, but the rest of us, maybe not so much. And um, I just like to know more and get educated on it. Absolutely. And uh, the best website for the site certification program is sustainablesites.org. Uh, it was created by the American Society of Landscape Architects, the U.S. Botanic Garden, and the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center at the University of Texas. So uh, like I said, it's probably the ideal rating system for a, a landscape project like this, but we can certainly compile some of the others that we've seen internationally and, and provide a list uh, of those options as well. Questions. It looks to me, you know, going through here, and for, probably for the benefit of the audience who didn't manage to get through this RFP without dozing off, um, there's a, a, you accomplished a lot of what uh, we'd ask you to do. You know, the, the uh, uh, shaded playgrounds. I think that's awfully important if we're going to put, you know, two playgrounds out. Are we having a playground one on the north on the, the hillside and the other trails, or are they both are on the same side? It would be on the hills and one on the trails. Okay. All right. Uh, and those are inclusive play elements that we're talking about that yeah. we've mentioned as well. Um, the um, the other thing is, you know, we talked about is the buffer around the property too, which I, you know, when I, I talked to um, uh, Brianne about it, you know, it said chain link fence that always goes, that's pretty ugly scenario, except that when I mean, you uh, cover that with uh, attractive hedges and so forth that, provides a nice security barrier for the community there. So you don't have people trying to get to the park from uh, through other private residential property. 
Um, I, I like the uh, the security uh, phone, the, the blue light security, because I think that's going to be important uh, for us as well. If we have a, a nice native, uh, you know, flora and fauna there, uh, where where people might um, uh, need to have clear vision, at, and the way you're going to lay it out, I think, is uh, is perfect, including electric car charging stations. Uh, that was something I don't think we had talked about, but obviously it's something that uh, probably will be needed more and more in the future. Uh, the question uh, regarding uh, parking and traffic, uh, I meant there was some mention there that that's not a part of this study. Do you anticipate us having to do that? And what kind of parking have we allocated uh, for this uh, park? Because not everybody's going to ride their bicycle over there like these other gentlemen did. Yeah, we have in the design, um, we've allocated what we feel is probably appropriate parking areas um, for this, but this is those are some of the issues that we want to make sure that we understand uh, from the city what their concerns are going to be um, at that point. So that's where we have to get a little bit further in on the more detailed design on the parking and the accessibility aspects, and then they'll they will identify if there needs to be any traffic. Uh, studies or parking studies associated with that, um, th those issues. So again, based upon our experience, we feel that there's adequate parking now. And again, I think from a sustainability perspective, you know, uh, and a graphic perspective on the, on the master plan, we showed it as all paved parking. You know, our, our thought is, is it probably doesn't need to all be paved parking uh, from a sustainability perspective. Um, some of those could be overflow parking in grass areas with wheel stops, et cetera. So again, to make it a little more um, sustainable um, and minimize the uh, the stormwater requirements that we would need for the project also. Mike, just uh, one or uh, two other questions. There, there was a discussion, this was a golf course, so we're using pesticides and herbicides on it. And there's uh, some mention of arsenic there. Uh, are, is that gonna be any kind of an issue as far as uh, you know, monitoring that and uh, is there going to be anything that we need to do to uh, to water sure. down the arsenic that's there and prevent any issues with the public? Will it be an issue? We're not sure yet. I mean, we know it's there. So first round of testing file, we did find arsenic in soil and groundwater. Um, we're part of this study is to do another phase of testing to see how widespread, where it is, so that we can address it properly prior to or during construction. Okay, good. Thank you. I hope, I hope it's uh, minimal. We hope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then, you know, and how we manage it through that point just varies based on what we have and how you guys want to have it managed. Um, the state of Florida is very progressive that we are allowed to keep contaminated areas on site as long as they're protected from the general public. So not everything needs to be cleaned up to the nth degree. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, this question for, for Mike and Steve brought this up is about the transit the nature from the north from the hills to the uh, the trails back and forth across uh, Jeffrey, and I suspect you're probably right. Unless there's a, a tunnel there, we're going to probably have to transit there at Second Avenue and Jeffrey, where that, that would be a pedestrian way. Will, will there be where will the parking be on the, uh, the the southern part of this property? Right? Is it going to be where the the hotel was? Uh, uh, originally, and then, of course, we had a space on that also for some other uh, facilities there, whether they're, you know, pickleball, tennis, or uh, I think that was in the design plan. That'll come later, because I think we're more interested in getting the trails and the, and the walking paths up and running uh, before we start right. any hard structure, I believe. Yeah, currently, our parking is shown on both sides of Jeffrey Street, um, both north and south um, on the hills and the trails. And the parking on the trail section is just east of the old uh, hotel site. So the hotel site is not earmarked for any um, improvements right now. So the appropriate parking or we think adequate parking is, is currently provided east of the, uh, the old hotel site at uh, Jeffrey Street and 2nd Avenue. Just uh, two final questions, and this may be totally uh, out of the box. Uh, any ideas what the uh, the a construction costs might be on, on a project of this nature? Um, well, again, we looked at this from a from a phasing perspective, and I apologize, I don't have that document in front of me, but um, I think the, our initial phases were uh, seven, 
seven million and two years of five million. So that's seventeen million, I think, is is what we had earmarked, I believe. And again, I apologize, I'm uh, not there, but I don't have that in front of me. But I think at, when we made the master plan presentation, that's the intent is to try to get this done. And that was one of the things that I mentioned is is as we go through this process, we look at doing an opinion of probable cost at each submittal. So as we refine the design, we'll start looking at more definitive costs. So we will identify, we know what the budget is and we, how we can keep it within that budget. Mike, thank you. The final question is, uh, once the park is uh, up and operational uh, with the, um, the way it's being built out, what do you think our uh, annual maintenance cost might be on a project this size? Wow, that's a trick question. That's a tough one. Um, I, I, I would hesitate to throw something out there, but um, I apologize. I, I don't know the answer to that. We can look into that. We can get back with Brianne on that, though. I, I'd appreciate it. I figured that would be a, a stretch to be able to, but I, I wanted to ask that and get it out there. And if you can come up sure. with a, some approximation, just help us in budgeting, I think. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Thank we'll you. do that. Thank you. One just thing, and I think the annual maintenance cost is hugely dependent on how we design the site as well. Um, you know, if we're doing a site certification, it will, um, you know, we're not going to have a lot of, um, turf hopefully where we're going to have a lot of um uh, water use and and i think the design of it really has to be our forethought in terms of how much maintenance is going to cost in the end too so um a lot of native plantings right mike <laughs> we'll absolutely. Our maintenance costs. Yep. Absolutely. um but i think that is one of the biggest things that we really need to think about when we think about parks in the city we think about green grass green grass costs a lot of money to maintain. So that is one of the things we really need to think about when we're designing this park. I think we've already decided how we're designing the park the, the, uh, with these designations. Uh, and uh, that's what I was curious about, you know, with the planning that we're putting in there, the, the maintenance cost should be less than if we had a bunch of green space. That's That was my point was asking that question to, since we're trying to get it certified um, and, and that's going to make cost us a little more up front, but probably you save us in the back end and long term maintenance. Right. Absolutely. One thing with the volunteers too, like the more volunteers we have, say we do have a group um, of 20 volunteers or 30 volunteers that is forms a group and creates the mountain bike trails. And I know um, the gentleman that was here said he goes out weekly to quiet waters. So if you have 10 volunteers going out weekly, that creates a much more safe environment, I feel like, to have your residents out at your park volunteering, taking care of the trails, having their kids come out there taking care of their trails. That's going to create a much safer environment behind the condos. Um, and also having a volunteer group possibly that takes care of the community garden. I mean, you want your residents behind there, right? The people that you know that are living in your community. So I feel like the more we foster this volunteer outreach that we're getting, the much safer and more community oriented park we're going to have. So we need to grab hold of this now when we have people coming here saying we want to do this. We don't want to turn them away and say, no, that's not happening. And I think, um, we've shown that we want that kind of you know community outreach so i think i think it's it's starting to happen there craig with the volunteers so i'm excited about that absolutely and if i could add to something else i'm sorry commissioner go ahead i'm sorry no if if you can bake it into this process to be it's essential i mean gumbo limbo continued on because of you know of gordon gilbert and then the science exploratorium it, it, it kind of dies once it's getting, you know, taken over, but, but we want it to be more volunteer based and there's enough pockets here that it could be very, um, I think, very incredible. Yeah, and, and if I could build upon that, you're exactly right when you said different pockets, there really are opportunities for different volunteer groups to be involved. Uh, you have the mountain bike uh, trails, that's one. The community garden is definitely another one. We're earmarking other areas along the trails for public art. So again, all those all those folks are you know advocates and part of our community that want to have a participation. 
that's what they said they would like in this park. So those are going to be the advocates and the folks that are that we anticipate will be volunteering for those uh, for those areas and such. Need a motion to approve this? I or? believe please do. Go ahead. Uh, I move to approve the work order for Miller Lake in the amount of eight hundred and eighty-eight thousand five hundred and seventy-five dollars. And I, am I correct? Is that the total amount of the work order? And so then there's off the. Huh? Or do we yes. need to add the other 36,000? I think you could just, as presented, if you want to. That sounds it. good. What she said. <laughs> Joanne. Commissioner Ernst? Commissioner Engel? Yes. Commissioner Rollins? Yes. Commissioner Vogelsang? Yes. Commissioner Wright? Motion passed. Thank you very much. We really appreciate all the support. I look forward to building a wonderful resource for you. Hey, thanks, Mike. Thanks, Lumi. And thank, thank you, everybody else, for being here, too. Okay, moving on to number five, AmeriCorps Builders Ocean Strand Fencing, Brian. Commissioners, we're still working on getting through Ocean Strand. We should have it. Our, our plan is to have it open to the public in February. We are waiting on approval of signage by the city and uh, they're a little backed up, so once we get that, we'll schedule the ribbon cutting, but we do still plan to have it open to the public this month. Um, tonight in your agenda packets are two um, change orders. One is to repair some fence on the western portion, which is the part that's going to be open to the public for 10300 and we are having some issues on the eastern portion of Ocean Strand with ATVs and motorbikes accessing the dune, so we'd like to add split rail fence on that side. That obviously has to go through permitting and and surveyed and all that. So that cost uh, for that 600 linear feet is 20,385. So I'm just looking tonight for approval of these two change orders in the amount of $30,685 for the two. Approve. Commissioner Ernst. Mr. Engel. Commissioner Rollins. Commissioner Vogelsang. Commissioner Wright. Yeah. Motion passed. Moving on to approval of payroll and invoices, Mr. Ernst. I'd like to make a motion for a pay, uh, approval of payroll and invoices and a reissue of a check that stop payment was on for $93,246.25. Joanne? Ernst? Commissioner Ingle? Commissioner Rollins? Commissioner Vogel say? Yes. Commissioner Wright? Yes. Motion passes. Okay, reports and discussion items. First, we will go to Executive Director Harms. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, commissioners, we worked with the city staff and we now have rangers doing patrols of Boca Tica. Um, they actually had a report where they removed somebody on a motorbike this weekend. So they're there, they're working, and they're going to keep you guys safe out there. So they're doing some random patrols right now to establish best times to go. And so we're happy to have them out there and grateful for the city's uh, cooperation on that. The tower bids are in, so the city is evaluating those bids. My understanding is that we have a bid under our budget uh, number, so I'm excited about that and hope to have some information at our next meeting uh, more concrete on that. The Countess to Hornley Maintenance Building contract was executed and the notice to proceed is going to be issued so shortly. They're expecting construction to begin in the next three months. Um, I wanted to talk about the YMCA over at Patch Reef. They're building up their programming. So um, they have a lot of exciting programs happening at Patch Reef, karate, gymnastics, young engineers, dance, acting classes, and they have that on their website. And um, while I was looking at that, I also saw the Willow Theater has an exciting uh, season coming up from February and March, some fun shows there. So also check out the Willow Theater's shows, get back out. Um, we'll get back inside the theater and see some good shows over there. There's not a bad seat in the house. And then I had the chance uh, two weekends ago to go see Top Soccer in action. And I just wanted to say I, I met with Susie out there. I was really blown away by, I guess, the reach of the program. And I had this conversation with Commissioner Rollins earlier, too. Um, there was so much diversity in the participants, and there was smiles from volunteers, even the people working. And Susie must have been there all day long by the time I got there, and she still had a smile on her face. So 
I just, it was great to see that program. And I feel like we're really lucky to have these types of programs in our community. So I just want to acknowledge that. And um, Mrs. Hurley is gone, but her and all those volunteers that work so hard on this, I, I just think it's a tremendous program. And we're really lucky to have that um, right here. And I also, the Rangers and the police were out there that day coordinating traffic. So it was a, a lot of coordination happening. And it was really well done. So um, just wanted to recognize that. And that's all I have. Legal counsel. Thank you, Madam Chair and commissioners. Good evening. On a, on a professional note, Jacob and I both want to thank you for uh, engaging the Brian Miller and our law firm to give you an outside fairness opinion about what it is that you're dealing with in the context of the three P projects and how you could structure them legally and consistent with both state statute as well as the AG's opinion. Um, we appreciate the fact that you were diligent in your public thinking to to seek an outside review of the matter and to get and to receive from them a very uh, clear analysis of things. It's an intricate subject matter. You, the IRS code is not a simple document, as we all know, as taxpayers. And from the standpoint of the tax-exempt bond status, that mattered very greatly to all of you when, you when you asked us to help you to find a better answer to the questions. Uh, the memo is a good instructional document. I think the BMNO can be very helpful to us going forward. And we welcome whatever options might be available legally to implement as things progress with the organization's uh, ultimate goals and objectives at Ocean Breeze Park. Uh, all of which are, uh, are again, laid out very nicely in, in the middle leg report thus far. Um, from the standpoint of uh, any other thing, any, any further other matters that we have, we have no litigation report, obviously, but welcome the opportunity of updating you from time to time as things proceed, particularly this session when the legislature begins. They're in special session now, as you know, dealing with a very unique topic, a special district. The Reedy Creek District is, is not, not legally different than any other special district in Florida, which are governed by state laws and things that relate to how you operate as a special district. We welcome keeping you fully advised during the next uh, session in 2023. Other than that, Jake, I, and I thank you very much for the opportunity to serve you as your general counsel, and we look forward to more time together. So thank you very much for the privilege. Thank you. Susie, you want to start? Um, a couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity to go to the pickleball tournament at Pat Sharif and got to see our own Melissa Dawson, our facilities manager, in action. Um, it was well attended with participants and spectators. Um, everything was very well run. And I think it was a, a very successful tournament. Uh, don't you agree? So, Melissa, you did a great job. Um, I, I want to would be remiss if we didn't thank um, Councilman Elect Mark Wigder. When do you take office, Mark? March thirty first. Uh, you know, th this is a second meeting, and I think this has been a little more cordial meeting uh, than we had its first introduction. We were talking about the CRA, but uh, Mark, I, I, Mark was uh, on a uh, committee uh, to uh, recreational committee with bike pass. Isn't that correct, Mark? So I know that he was interested in what these gentlemen were saying. We'll probably see Mark out there on our trails when we get them uh, get them completed. But Mark, thank you for coming. Uh, I think you can see our, our recreation interests are, are sincere and uh, having you here to hear uh, what we're doing and see what we're doing is, is very much appreciated. And uh, I hope that you'll continue to drop in here on us and uh, uh, and then, of course, we have uh, you know, Zoom that when you can't get here, you can always listen in, and uh, we appreciate that. Uh, and uh, that's all I have, Madam Chair. I, I, I just will say one final thing. There is not a, a nicer lady in this world than uh, Lynn Hurley. Uh, and, I mean, she's got the heart of gold, and I, I said this before, I have never seen her with anything but a smile on her face, and I know she has some health issues. You would never know that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Craig. There, but um, Lynn's, a, Lynn's a gold standard too. So we, we've got great people in the community and it's engaging them is important. Um, and to Bob's point, I think um, the whole Ocean Breeze design of the golf course and everything, it's gonna be a big endeavor. Uh, not golf course, but the whole environment is going to be a very big endeavor. And so just chewing on the east side will be a, a project for a few years. So I think uh, it's going to require city assistance and it's going to require others to participate to really make it nice and it's doable. And I think um, 
uh, the, the folks, Mike Roll and the team have given us a roadmap. So we just have to kind of march along our way with them on it and keep the community engaged. So we'll go from there. Thank you. Go ahead, Steve. Well, first, uh, having done a little bit of, of digging, very little bit of digging, but digging nonetheless, uh, it, it appears to me that there are volunteers and then there's Lynn Hurley. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, uh, when you said she sets a gold standard, you're right. I'm more like a platinum standard. Uh, I've, uh, you know, the things I've heard uh, more than positive. And I think uh, what we did tonight uh, uh, was a long time coming and I'm glad we did it. Um, uh, another thing I wanted to touch on uh, with uh, the presentation from the bond attorneys tonight, uh, it occurs to me that the, the thing that would give us the most flexibility in developing the west side of Ocean Breeze would be to own the property in its entirety. And uh, just something to chew on for the rest of the commissioners, uh, maybe considering the idea of setting up a sinking fund of where we could allocate uh, money so that on July 1st, 2027, we could present the city of Boca Raton with a check paying off the uh, remaining bond balance in its entirety. And then we can proceed as we see fit without having to worry about uh, whether we can hire somebody uh, on a, a PPP basis. It just opens everything up for us. It puts things off, but it uh, gives us, I think, the flexibility that, we, that we've wanted uh, all along. Um, and this is no reflection on the city, Mr. Wigner. This is just uh, uh, a way to uh, get this off of uh, uh, square one and to move on and to do it so the way it should be done. And that's all I got. Steve. Um, yeah, she hugged like everybody in the room tonight. She was like such a hugger and so happy. It was just like, I could just totally see her out there on the soccer field, just, it was wonderful. So I'm glad we were able to do that for her. I think it really, um, she really loved it, so. He's to the kids for the buddies and the players every week. And yeah. So, um, so I have nothing else tonight. So um, that is it. To adjourn. All right. Joanne. Adjourns. Commissioner Ringo. Yeah. Commissioner Rollins. Commissioner Vogelsang. Commissioner Wright. Yes. We are adjourned. <laughs>